Okay, we're gonna get started. Again, I'm Dr. Alicia Ruminski from Frostburg State University, and I coordinate the Communication Leadership Lab, which is an opportunity for people to come together through dialogue, deliberation, other kinds of forum experiences virtually as well as face-to-face, -face, which we hope to do sometime soon. Um, but this is our annual leadership residency program, which is co-sponsored this year by our leadership studies program, as well as the Department of Management. And so I was happy to collaborate with not only partners from on campus, but also from partners in the community. We have three amazing uh, leaders who are going to talk with us tonight. And um, first though, what we would like to do is go over a few guidelines. So one of the things is make sure you're muted if you have unmuted yourself. Um, also, we are recording this. So just be aware you're acknowledging that you're okay with being recorded if you're participating. The other thing is that Ray mentioned, and um, she's gonna adjust her mic a little so you can hear her better, um, that go ahead and add something into the chat if you don't mind to introduce yourself, tell us who you are or how you're connected to the community. Um, if you, you know, are studying in a particular area, if you're leading in a particular area, um, we made an intentional effort to invite other nonprofit leaders from our region. So you might wanna mention what you're working with if you're part of an organization yourself. Um, also, um, we are um, going to lock the meeting and try to work to be secure. So if anything comes up that's unusual, we know that that sometimes happens in Zoom land, we'll take care of it. If we need to shut things down, we'll just set up and do this again, right? So um, we have some different people participating that we'll acknowledge in just a bit. But um, I also wanted to mention that um, we are... Um, you know, just excited to continue the conversations that we find important in our times. And we think that why not nonprofit and how local leadership is addressing the relevance of nonprofit leadership today is one of those important and timely topics. Anything else you want to add, Ray? Well, first off, can you hear me a bit better now? I have a trick phone. Yeah, that sounds better. Okay. Um, well, I am the communications lab assistant. I'm looking forward to hearing this discussion. I'm sure that we'll be learning a lot. Um, please try to pay attention, be polite, and be listening and be being ready to think about what you're hearing and get ready to talk at the end because we want to be inclusive and we want to give everyone a chance to engage in this dialogue. Great, thanks, Ray. And some of those are highlighting the Choose Civility principles that are part of the Choose Civility chapter in Allegheny County, which is part of the guidelines that we have as a starting point to negotiate civil discourse. So um, one of the things that we wanted to emphasize is the reason we have a leadership residency. Our leadership studies minor emphasizes organizational leadership as well as citizen leadership. And again, we find these are important in our times. Communication, ethics, as well as leadership context are also important to study in an interdisciplinary fashion in that minor program. And um, this annual opportunity then brings together leaders or scholars of leadership to have conversations about relevant topics, in this case, nonprofit leadership. So we also hope it's a networking opportunity and you can follow up with people that you meet today. But this all started, um, long ago, early in the 20th century, 21st century, actually, um, when the Leadership Studies minor program was created. And our first annual leadership residency was organized by uh, Professor Ruth Wallinger. And I'm here with uh, Dr. Mike Wallinger, who both of them were my mentors. Um, Dr. Wallinger is a professor emeritus in communication studies at Frostburg State. And he just wants to say a few words about Ruth, who sadly is not with us today. Make sure you unmute yourself, Mike. I'm here to remind everybody that one. <laughs> oh, okay. Now can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, got unmuted somewhere right along the way there. Uh, thank you for the uh, comments there, Alicia. Uh, Ruth was the first leadership studies minor coordinator. 
And uh, if you saw the uh, videos earlier, the pictures earlier, you saw three pictures of Ruth and they depict her life outside of the professional life. Uh, there is outdoor recreation, which was very important to her. Uh, so therefore, pick, uh, hiking in Mount Rainier National Park in September 2019. Uh, family was very important to her. Uh, three loving granddaughters. <coughs> Pardon me, yeah. the phone is getting me. Uh, friendship. You have to, I understand this one. You have to realize that that photo was taken at Alicia and Matt's wedding uh, you know, a couple of years ago. So. With that in mind, I'd like to shift gears and focus. I'd like to put in a plug for the Ruth A. Wallinger Leadership Studies Scholarship. Uh, there is an endowed scholarship which will take effect in 22, 23. <laughs> uh, and there is a pass through scholarship which takes a place that uh, takes effect in uh, uh, 21, 22 to bridge the gap there. Uh, <clears throat> There are three criteria, three other criteria for that scholarship I'm going to reference here, okay? Uh, they reference, they look at Bruce's leadership style and her communication abilities, okay? So first of all, there is a requirement of a minor in leadership studies, a declared minor. Now, as a major force in developing leadership studies minor, Ruth was particularly good at working with faculty from three different departments, as well as administrators from uh, academic affairs, uh, pardon me, uh, student affairs, and then coordinating the disparities. Yeah, now, if any of you have ever worked with academia before, you know that, that is a skill that is not always well practiced. Uh, but the result was a minor that truly integrates uh, academic and experiential perspectives on leadership. Okay? Second uh, criteria I'd like to refer to here was the uh, reference to academic standards, a, a minimum of 3.530 GPA. Okay? Ruth was known to have very high academic standards and uh, she knew and practiced a philosophy that uh, grades were not given like a gift from a benefactor. They were earned, okay? <laughs> pardon me. Uh, so to leadership, is not given like a, by a gift from, from a benefactor. Instead, it is earned through hard work and strong application of strong communication skills. Okay. Finally, I'd like to refer to the concept of uh, participation in the community as a criteria for the scholarship. Okay. Ruth was what I will refer to as a participant leader in the community roles. Okay. That I mean, she usually led without an assigned title of authority, such as president of the organization or chair of the committee. Okay? Instead, she led with an analytic mind and strong communication skills. Uh, pardon me, I'm really getting choked up here. <coughs> Too much pollen here. Uh, let me explain with a recent conversation. Okay? A month or two after Ruth's passing, uh, I got a phone call from her former pastor, Reverend Chuck Erskus. And <clears throat> at one point in our conversation, he said, no, I don't believe any member of the congregation ever voiced more analysis of or disagreement with comments that I made in committees. And <clears throat> pardon me, just, uh, but she always did so in a way that we always walked away as friends and with mutual respect for each other. If today, <clears throat> If today we had more of that analytic and communicative approach in our national leaders, we have a much better world to live in. And on that note, I leave you to get on with the program as designed, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much for sharing that information and that story. Um, we are so sorry for you and your family's loss. So grateful for Ruth's legacy, though. You know, I'm glad to be picking up and kind of continuing this tradition annually and uh, the work together, you know, in, in the campus and the community environment. So we are gonna turn next to briefly hear comments from Dr. Sudhir Singh, who I believe is joining us. Um, he is our Dean of the College of Business. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Sudhir. Thank you, thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much and, uh, and, and, and good evening, everybody. And uh, I was just going to say what a legacy uh, Ruth has left behind and, and who better to, to take that forward, uh, Alicia, than you. So uh, a, a real tribute to, um, 
uh, to the volunteers and, and, and to you, Alicia. So first and foremost, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sudhir Singh. I'm the uh, Dean of the College of Business, and I'm going to keep it really short. I first and foremost wanted to uh, congratulate uh, all of the organizers of this uh, wonderful event. And uh, I was thinking that this topic of nonprofit leadership has, uh, it's always been relevant, but I think it's been heightened in some ways by, uh, by just these extraordinary uh, public health and economic challenges uh, that have been wrought on us. And, uh, and we're, we're all kind of scrambling and learning to, to, to do more with less. And uh, my, my other thought there was that nonprofit, of course, as we all know, uh, perform a, a really vital service and offer significant, uh, what I would call capacity building and, and networking benefits to, to the community. And of course, they've been uh, critical in meeting the needs of those segments of the population uh, that are often left behind and are not served by other sectors. So in that vein, it's, uh, it's really exciting to be able to hear from the leaders of three really truly premier organizations from uh, within our region. Um, I was also going to just uh, very quickly add in my specific role as, a, as, as Dean of the, of the College of Business that uh, we have great interest in, in expanding and uh, really a great investment in uh, creating opportunities for service learning uh, for our students, and we'd like to uh, partner uh, with uh, the organizations that are represented here and perhaps others uh, in order to try to expand these opportunities uh, for our students. And of course, you know, to, to uh, create what I might call a, a symbiotic sort of a relationship where there's benefits uh, to the students and to the faculty members, and of course, where our faculty members uh, can extend their expertise towards advancing the fine work that you, that, that you do. Um, I, I see here that the Department of Management, and I think Dr. Monahan is here, and I wanted to uh, just give a quick shout out to uh, Dr. Ma uh, Dr. Monahan and the Department of Management for all of the outreach. And again, uh, Alicia, as you mentioned, this is a very collaborative endeavor. So kudos to you and to and to management. And and we are looking to pursue this uh, following this event. And with that, I'm just going to kind of step aside and looking to essentially just uh, just uh, listen and learn, and uh, and see in terms of how we can carry these conversations forward. So thank you again so much for having me, and uh, um, and and looking forward to hearing from our three leaders here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh, and yes, thank you, Dr. Monahan, for boosting us in this opportunity to connect and collaborate. I mean, I, I look forward to collaboration and partnering always. And so it's been a pleasure to get your feedback and, and your participation. Um, I know we have Dr. Siegerstad, I think who popped in here, a, a former member of our leadership study steering committee, but also um, I think um, Mr. Aldalia, are you here also? I think he was gonna I, pop uh, in. I'm here, I was muted. It's nice, to, it's nice to be with the group. It looks like a terrific program coming up. Yeah, so I just wanted to acknowledge um, our, you know, person who is coordinating regional and economic development through the university is joining us too. So um, we are going to move on so we can get to hear from our three leaders. We're going to do a brief bio of each of our leaders, but I wanted to tell you the way that this is going to work. Um, it's basically going to be an opportunity to uh, listen and observe, right? And so we are going to have an opportunity to talk later in the session. We're going to respect everyone's time and keep to, you know, an hour and a half total. So we'll make sure that we let everyone enjoy the rest of their evenings. Um, but we are going to make sure that uh, people know who's involved in the roundtable discussion and then, um, you know, give them an opportunity to talk and, and reflect together. Um, what's been a wonderful opportunity is to work with um, Leah, Julie, and Jennifer because I'm becoming a part of the circle almost, it feels like, but they have this connection that is amazing to witness. They are collaborating in the community locally um, and they invite people into that circle. So I, I hope that's, you know, what you feel like happens in, in listening and observing the fishbowl round table. We just are going to let them talk and, and have that conversation and, and observe for a while. Um, but let me first introduce um, who's with us. And actually, I think, uh, is it you or me, Ray, that goes first? It's you, right? 
You're going to introduce Leah. Yep, it's me first. Okay. Leah Schaefer is the executive director of the Community Trust Foundation. Since joining the organization in 2017, she has successfully doubled its assets, increased name recognition, and helped many philanthropic donors enhance the quality of life in their community. Schaefer's career has always been guided by her underlying passion for youth development and community wellness. She brings her strong professional experience in small business ownership, grant management, and nonprofit work to help make a positive difference in the region. Originally from Bedford, PA, she returned to the area after earning her degrees and resides in Mineral County, West Virginia. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jennifer Walsh is the executive director of the Greater Cumberland Committee, a 501c3 nonprofit focused on projects of regional relevance in the areas of economic development, transportation infrastructure, education and workforce development, energy and natural resources, and next generation leadership. Following law school, she served as a law clerk for Justice Joseph Baca at the New Mexico Supreme Court in Santa Fe, then for Judge Hiram Pug Lugo at the District of Columbia Superior Court in Washington, DC. Walsh worked as a legislative assistant in the US Senate for former US Senator Jeff Bingham, Bingaman before moving to Cumberland. She's been practicing law in Cumberland since 2004 and practices part-time in the areas of state and long-term care planning at Gebert, McMullen, Pay, and Getty. She is a fellow in the inaugural 2019-2020 Appalachian Leadership Institute class. And Julie Westendorf it serves as executive director of the Allegheny Arts Council. She joined the organization in 2018 after relocating from the Washington, D.C. area with a specific intention to get involved in a small rural community. Her career includes more than 15 years of corporate event planning and nonprofit management, as well as several years spent traveling with two lawmakers where she is responsible for managing logistics around the globe. Westendorf is active in the community and serves on the boards of the Western Maryland Health Systems of Glory and Allegheny County Chamber of Commerce. Okay, thank you, Ray. And welcome ladies. I'm excited to be with you today and we are gonna turn it over to you. We're gonna actually make it so that we can see each other and hear each other. This way, again, any of you in uh, the session today, if you don't mind staying muted, if you have a comment or a question and you wanna add it to the chat, we could do that for now. Um, but we're gonna kind of give our three women leaders an opportunity to just um, you know, talk a bit on their own before we jump in and interact with them. So, and I say women leaders, it is Women's History Month, but what's amazing is that you know, their efforts cut across all boundaries, all you know, standpoints and all kinds of work sectors. So I'll turn it over to you three. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Well, I'm Jennifer Walsh and thank you for such a warm welcome. It's really nice to be here and you certainly are part of the circle. So it's been really a pleasure to work with you to put tonight's event on. And there are so many of you in the crowd that I know. So welcome everybody. There's um, Aldalia actually sits on my board of directors. And um, I just know many of you from my work in nonprofit and also just from the community. So. Uh, lots of friends and colleagues, so welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, we wanted to start tonight, and Dr. Singh did a great introduction and just sort of introduced the concept of nonprofits. And I know that many of you serve either on board of directors or have you know worked for nonprofits. And so we certainly don't need to belabor this point, but we did think it was important that you may have students on the call who don't necessarily know what a nonprofit is or the role that they serve in the community. So um, Leah and Julie, maybe you could expand a bit on the brief summary that Dr. Singh provided in terms of, you know, what, what really is the role of a nonprofit in our community? Julie, you wanna go ahead first? Oh, <laughs> I was gonna say the same to you. Uh, well, first of all, thanks everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. I, 
also want to thank members of my board and friends and family who've come tonight and special thanks to Dr. Rumansky for giving us this incredible opportunity. And also just a big shout out to the other nonprofit leaders who've taken time out. I know that it's a big lift and you're probably excited to be home for the evening. So thanks for tuning in. Um, we were kind of having a discussion about nonprofit and we specifically wanted to address it for students on the call tonight because it's not a career path that, that most people really think about unless they have a very strong desire to do something cause specific. But nonprofits in their simplest form are charitable based organizations. There are several different forms of those. They can be involved in lobbying or they can just be like my organization and accept donations and contributions, but they serve a mission in, in a community in some way. And um, they should operate from a strategic plan uh, that kind of guides their work and helps them stay on track and stay focused on, on serving whatever community it is that they serve. Um, and so I understand that there's about 800 uh, nonprofits in Allegheny County. I heard that data point recently. So there is a lot of nonprofit work being done, even if we're not always aware of it. Leah? Yeah, I, I think in a nutshell, I want to echo first the um, appreciation that both my colleagues and Alicia shared in welcoming everybody. Um, the nonprofits really embody the best of America. I mean, it's the way we come together to fill the gaps, as Julie said, where county, federal, state um, agencies aren't able to do so. And we really provide um, the ability to make things happen specific to the needs in our area and the people uh, that we care about. So it actually motivates and pulls in the local residents to get involved in their own issues and um, meet those needs. Uh, so we wanted to move from that and really wanted to talk about how our organizations fill those specific needs in um, our area, what our services we provide, um, what lane we are kind of in, even though we cross over and do collaborate a lot together. So um, Jennifer, do you want to start in with TGCC? Sure, thanks. So the Greater Cumberland Committee is actually modeled originally after some other greater committees in the state. And we are, uh, for the most part, funded through uh, corporate and uh, member donations. So all of our Corporate council members are leaders in business in the region, and our partners are made up of elected officials from all levels of government, both um, you know, at the local level all the way through to the federal level. We work uh, very closely with um, other partners, uh, leaders like the two of you who uh, run other nonprofits and other civic organizations, and there are many of you on the call who work closely with my organization. We are, I think, unique in the region in that we do serve the region and not just um, the county. And so our organization's footprint covers two, the, the two westernmost counties in Maryland, Mineral County in West Virginia, and Somerset and Bedford counties in Pennsylvania. And that causes or creates a lot of opportunities and also some jurisdictional, you know, um, conundrums at times in terms of, you know, working with leadership and uh, trying to identify opportunities um, across that spectrum. But our real focus is on economic development and our projects are really within those areas that um, was shared in my bio, which is uh, primarily our signature project is in a major transportation infrastructure project. And we also um, have committees working in energy and natural resources. Al Dalia, who's on the call, leads a uh, committee made up of um, economic development leaders from across the region, including tourism and chambers. I know we've got some of those folks on this call. And we're also working in the education space. So we do lead a committee with all of our local um, leaders from um, FSU and our local community colleges. So our work is really intended to create growth opportunity and investment um, in, in the region. Julie, what about you? 
Uh, great. Well, thank you. Um, that was really impressive. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm with the Allegheny Arts Council. We are one of 24 county arts agencies across the state of Maryland. Um, to kind of echo some of what Jennifer said, we are also uh, partially structured as a membership-based organization. And what I mean by that is we receive about one third of our annual funding through state grant funds uh, that are distributed to counties. And then the additional two thirds of our funds each year, we receive through a variety of different fundraising mechanisms. Uh, I mentioned membership, contributions, uh, grant applications, uh, partnerships, registration for various workshops and, and on and on and on. But that is an ongoing effort for us is to continue raising money to be self-sustaining. Um, I love when I get asked the question about what we do because I think one of the biggest misnomers in our community is what we do. Um, we are very fortunate to have a beautiful gallery right in downtown Cumberland where you probably know that we have uh, just about monthly exhibitions that feature artists and artistry from not only just local but regional and even some national artists and we do a number of shows through the year, juried shows and competitions that are great fun and they bring art to the community that perhaps some people in our community won't have the opportunity to see. So we're very proud of that. But many people don't understand the other part of our work and that is we are very mission oriented and we have five objectives and they include uh, promoting health and well-being through the arts. So you will see us in a lot of different places working in mindfulness, working in community health, working in the school system. Uh, we also contribute to economic development and we are very serious about that job because the arts are a major player in, in economic development in communities. So we've worked a lot over the last few years to try to help our community understand the role, the role that arts and culture plays. Um, one of our primary objectives is to support local artists and arts organizations. And we do that through opportunities, but we also do it through direct, direct grant funding. We fund uh, local arts orgs as well as individual artists each year and help them as well continue on with their work. Um, and then we have two other objectives. One is just to be sustainable, which is not the sexiest part of nonprofit, but it's really important if you wanna be around for more than a year or two. And also just to increase awareness of the arts in our community. So we do that through a ton of different programs. Uh, we have an art lab that travels around. We partner constantly with other organizations um, and we are always looking for opportunities. So if you have an idea for us, we chances are we're gonna be interested in, in partnering in collaboration. Leah, you wanna share with us about CTF? I'd love to. Um, a community foundation, I probably should give um, a little bit of introduction about what a community foundation is to begin with. Um, community foundations are all across the uh, US. There's about seven or 800 of them. And um, they are designed to serve a specific geographical location. And so our footprint is Garrett in Allegheny counties in Maryland and Mineral County in West Virginia. So you can see the overlap of the three of us and how we um, end up working together in different ways. As a community foundation, we work with local donors who want to meet local needs um, with their finances. So we help individuals and families and organizations established funds um, that will be long-term to address the charitable interests that they have. Um, we, in short terms, we establish the fund, we manage and invest it, and then we turn it back around in impactful granting into the community um, to our nonprofits and helping them to do what they do best. We 
are instead of like a lot of nonprofits are very narrowly focused on their purpose. Ours is very broad. Um, we just want to improve the lives of the residents in our area. And um, in doing so, we don't come to the community and say, join our cause. We come to our donors and say, what is it that you're passionate about? And here's how we can help you impact that. Um, so if you look at our um, investment, reinvestment into the community over the last 10 years, we've reinvested um, almost $6 million in um, the areas of health and wellness, arts and historical preservation, a thriving community environment, and education and youth leadership. Awesome. And I just want to point out that, you know, in this case, one great tie in between us is that the Arts Council has often been recipient of grant funds from Community Trust Foundation through the years. And um, in fact, we have one program right now going with them. So we're deeply thankful for their role in the community. They help support us as well. You know, something else that I didn't point yeah. out that is a connector with us three is that like most nonprofits, we're board um, governed. So um, it is an organization where um, decisions are made by uh, individuals who are invested in the community, who have a passion and believe in the mission of the nonprofit. Um, so it's a deeply rooted um, run organization. Okay. And I'll add to that, Leah, I think one of the things that's been really interesting between the three of our organizations is that we have many of this, we have many connections between our board members. So while we might not necessarily have the, you know, an exact overlap, I know that the two of you do, we certainly have, you know, ties between either family ties or some other connections uh, that closely align our organizations. And I also just wanted to share personally, Leah and I have been working together with a client and it's been really wonderful to be able to see someone who has left the area, who is so deeply invested in, um, you know, supporting the region is now finding a way, you know, despite the fact that he doesn't live here anymore to support through your funds. And so that's been a really fabulous experience for my client and for me. And I just want to compliment the job that you're doing. Um, and Julie, I just also want to say, um, I think that your ability to lead the organization in a way that has helped educate the, com the community to really understand the place and the role of the arts and economic development and community development has been part of your legacy at the organization. So thank you both for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, to um, move on a little bit, this is kind of a fun question that we enjoyed brainstorming a bit about in our planning conversations. And I'm gonna start with Jen on this one. Um, could you share a little bit with the group tonight about your kind of nonprofit birth story, if you will. How, how did you arrive here? <laughs> well, it was definitely not linear. Um, I was a practicing attorney for a number of years and owned my own practice and was in practice with um, some partners. And a couple of years ago, I had some members of my board reach out to ask if I would be interested in um, considering the position. And I think, you know, in reflecting on this question, I think it's really the skill set that led them to think of me as an applicant. And so, you know, leading a nonprofit is very much like running a small, medium, big business um, and really requires, you know, I, I would say an entrepreneurial type of mindset. You know, it's, it's, I think that the three of us recognize that we serve many roles in our organizations and that, you know, we're the creative director, we're the management, um, we are, you know, figuring out how to maintain and balance a budget. You know, there are a number of, and we're building relationships and cultivating relationships um, and also managing whatever the programs of work are. We have multiple bosses. You know, I, I have 12 bosses sitting on my board. I know both of you have bigger boards than I do. So I think it's really a multifaceted role and, you know, really in reflecting on that process of, of being recruited into the organization, I think that, you know, that was probably what was most appealing to them was that I had some experience um, and really a mindset of, of 
being willing to take a little bit of risk and to really just be creative. And so, um, you know, it's been, it's been a wonderful experience and I've really enjoyed getting to know the community in a different way than I had in just my private practice. And, you know, I don't know that I would know so many folks on this call today if I hadn't stepped into this role. So, um, so again, it was, it was sort of by happenstance, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Thank well, we're you. We're all glad you're here. Thank you. Leah, what about you? I think it's so fascinating that as we compare our stories, um, there aren't, <laughs> that none of us really planned on um, being where we are. It kind of fell into our lap. But what we can do is trace back in our um, professional experiences, things that led up to that skill set, as Jennifer referred to, that prepared us um, to take on the role, roles that we fill. Um, I wasn't necessarily looking for nonprofit, but a um, friend of a friend reached out and, and said, this organization is looking for a director. Uh, would you be interested? And um, it, uh, to be honest, it was a little daunting to me since that wasn't really something I had been um, involved in. Um, but I just think, especially for the students that are joining us and, you know, even those of us who are um, several years into our professional lives, it's always good to remember that um, opportunities lead to more opportunities. And um, I would encourage the students to not always expect that first job to be your dream job. Um, to look at the opportunity as a building block to where you're going to end up. I can look back in my, um, my experiences and see my experience with small business and how it helped me with budgeting and finances. I can look at my um, previous position in running a um, state and federal funded um, youth risk reduction program and how that helped with uh, grant management and understanding of that. So many things. Um, my undergrad was broadcast journalism and I did public speaking all the time and it, it led me to feel comfortable in reaching out and meeting new people and presenting, um, spending all day on a Zoom call. However, whatever you end up uh, doing, so many of the skills that we um, end up using, all three of us in our positions, have been um, a collection of experiences through our life. So, um, Julie, I think your story is just as fascinating. Well, my story is a little different uh, from these ladies, but my husband once said, and for those students who are attending, you can roll your eyes now because you will have no idea what I'm talking about. But um, there was a game that that used to that I used to play when I was a kid called Pachinko, and you put a marble in the top, and it would bounce around and sort of end at the bottom. And my husband once said that you know, your career path is a little like a pachinko board. I mean, when you look at it, you're like, where is it going? And what, what the heck? It's like taking a left turn. But when you look at it over the course of time, you do realize that everything that you learn along the way creates a building block to the next thing. Um, I will be honest, I had no burning desire to work in nonprofit. I landed in one when I was 27 years old. And to be frank, I didn't even really know what a nonprofit did. Um, but I did grow up in a home where my father was a pastor and, uh, he frequently had people at our home that he was counseling or that he was encouraging. And so I witnessed a life of service, uh, from just the time I was a little tight on. And, um, I think that really impacted me a lot. When I look back at my career now and the things that I've done, you might say, well, what does event planning have to do with service? Service, but it is all about creating experiences, making people comfortable. Um, even my work with lawmakers where I shuttled them from point A to point B and made sure they were fed and on time is service. And people like that are putting a lot of trust in their teams to make sure that they look good and that they're well represented. Um, and so really everything I've ever done is about service. And um, Someone put in the chat box earlier that nonprofits serve a lot of different constituencies, and that's also true. Um, we serve our boards of directors, we serve our members, we serve the community at large. 
Um, but I do think if you're considering nonprofit work, having a heart of service is important. It'll be what keeps you going when things sometimes get a little hairy and a little demanding and uh, where the path isn't always clear. And so, uh, but I personally have found it deeply rewarding. And um, so I, I encourage you to consider it as a possibility for your life and your work. Thank you. So here's sort of a, um, the, you know, it's the relevance question. So what is the relevance of nonprofit leadership today? Leah, do you want to take that one first? Um, sure, I'd love to. Actually, um, I think we are setting the tone for our community. Um, and eventually that's a ripple effect um, from there. Um, we are asked to do a lot. I think Dr. Singh said something that may have gotten glossed over, but it was very profound, is that we are needing to do more and more with less and less. And um, so we as nonprofits do set the tone for the community um, in our own service, in our own commitment um, and transparency in the things that we do. And I'm encouraged by the other nonprofits, um, specifically these two, um, as I work with them, that um, as the old saying is iron sharpens iron, that it's, um, we need to be um, working together, encouraging one another to continue to be doing what, what needs done in our community because there isn't always going to be uh, funds there to do it. Uh, we have to be able to um, encourage and inspire um, our donors, our community to join together and collaboratively um, strengthen the fabric within our community. What do you think, Jennifer? I, I totally agree with you. And I think that, you know, from my perspective, especially engaging in, you know, with leaders across the region, I think that there's also just a need to, you know, I think we need good leaders. I think we need, you know, bold, um, big hearted leaders who are willing to engage on difficult topics. I think we need creativity more than ever. I think we need, you know, folks who are willing to step into um, forward thinking, visionary, you know, projects and missions and initiatives. And I think it takes a lot of courage, you know, to be out front on those types of issues. So I know that, you know, many of the folks who are on this call that I, that I know their work are very much fit that um, profile. And I think it's, I think it's more important than it has ever been to have, you know, leaders who are willing to shed sort of old mindsets and really step in, step into um, bolder visions. So that, that to me, there's a real opportunity in the nonprofit sector to allow those leaders to shine. Billy, what are you thinking? Um, well, one thing that I, you know, probably won't be popular for saying this with you two, but it's the truth. And that is that we do wear many hats in this sector. Uh, I often joke that I am the chief trash collector in our office. And uh, sometimes I wash the dishes and sometimes I, you know, am carrying supplies and it's all part of it. And the, it is one of the things I actually love about working in the nonprofit sector is that it's very variable, um, but it's also very humbling. So we can never get, you know, too ahead of ourselves in the work that we do because there's never enough resources. And to that point, um, I think sometimes in communities, there is a misunderstanding about uh, our government or our municipalities or our elected leadership that they are supposed to provide every single thing we need as communities. And that's, that's impossible. <laughs> um, and that's really where nonprofits step up. Um, I know particularly in the arts sector, community development, which is, you know, that big fancy word for kind of going into your community and doing capacity building and connecting and solving problems and, meet, and meeting needs that exist is exploding. There is just an unbelievable amount of work to be done. And I mean, I'm looking at Renee right now and I'm gonna use her as an example. Um, you know, the library system is an extraordinary 
extraordinary gift in this community. And the work that they do is not all what you think. I mean, they um, they serve as, as caregivers and uh, they provide food sometimes. And that is to the point that more than ever, nonprofits are being asked to do so, so much more. And that's why they're relevant and they're going to stay. That's not going to change. So uh, thank you for, for that good work that you all are doing to serve the community. You're right, Julie. Um, it's so true and, and you know, it goes right into another conversation we had and that was about what are the challenges of having nonprofits in this area and also the advantages. Um, I had seen that there are currently one and a half million nonprofits in the US, but there's also a statistic that says approximately 30% of those nonprofits fail to exist after 10 years. Um, and over half of them are chart um, that are chartered are destined to fail or fall within a few years. That's kind of scary um, because oftentimes nonprofits stem out of great passion and um, concern over something. But where does, where does the infrastructure come from that's going to make them last? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's important that we ident identify some of the necessities in a leader for a nonprofit um, and the nonprofit's need for having clear strategy um, organization, money management, um, all of those things that aren't the pretty parts that you think of when you talk about a nonprofit because you just think about all the help that you can provide. Um, so when we talk about the challenges in our area for um, in terms of nonprofit, nonprofit leadership, what comes to your mind? Jennifer? I think I think there are a couple of things. I think, you know, I, so, Julie, I think you gave the statistic that, that if there are 800 nonprofits in our community. Is that? That's what I heard. So I'm not I'm not sure. Feel free to fact check me. But there's a yeah, lot. There's a lot. Yeah. So I think in the end, you know, one of the major challenges is always funding. So how do we with that many organizations trying to serve all of the various <laughs> missions? You know, how do we create organizations that are not redundant, that are not, you know, serving the same missions? How do we look to donors? How do we, you know, sort of maximize the potential of federal, state, local funding opportunities without getting into each other's sort of lanes? I think the other challenging, um, at least from my perspective, another major challenge for nonprofits in our region is, you know, there are only so many folks who are willing to serve as board of directors. And so how do we get, you know, very forward thinking, high performing um, members of our community to participate at this, you know, sort of additional leadership level? And how do we engage those folks? How do we get them interested in our missions? How do we get them to serve as advocates of our organizations in the community and, you know, carry some of that fundraising weight for us? How do we train good board members and support them in those roles? So I think, you know, and I'll go back to one other comment that I made earlier, which is that I also think there's a mindset shift that needs to happen. And, and part of the work that in, in my work, what I notice is that, you know, I think that there is um, a scarcity mindset that you know, that there aren't enough resources. And in many ways there aren't, but it's how, how do we do more with what we have? And I know that from my perspective, it's making sure that we're in our, really in our own lane and that, you know, our mission is really serving um, in kind of the most concise and precise way. Mm -hmm. And that's not always easy to do because it's certainly easy to get, you know, 10 different folks looking to you to do 10 different things that might not necessarily be really aligned with your mission. So I think that there are many challenges, but you know, I think with good leadership and good collaboration and you know, I think the benefit of having the two of you as colleagues is our ability to communicate with each other and identify, you know, where are there places where you can do some of these things or you know, your organization is better to be the lead on, on a particular project. Jennifer, you're so right, without a clear, strategic plan, the mission can 
just uh, shift. The mission can blend or migrate or drift away from the original plan, um, especially when you do have so many people, you know, working together to try to come up with the best way to do things. Um, and you don't want that mission drift um, to violate the others that are serving in your community or to dilute the efforts that you or the others are doing. Um, but I do come back to community over competition. You know, we, and I think that's what's developed here is that we're not in competition for board members. We're not in competition for money. We're not, we're working together as a community that we can all do it together. Julie, Definitely. I, and I'll just add there, you know, some board members are better suited to be involved in your organization than mine, right? I think it's like really engaging in those skill sets that would make a particular community member a really good aligned board member. So I think there's all, you know, I think we, there's a lot we can be doing to help support uh, folks who want to volunteer and be engaged in our missions. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Julie. No, you're fine. Um, I just wanted to touch on two things and then take a slightly different bent from the other two gals on the question. Um, I give the, our board of directors at the Arts Council a lot of credit. A couple of years ago, they made one of our strategic objectives, sustainable operations, which, as I said before, is not sexy. You know, it's not exciting. But, you know, you can only be so exciting if you don't have a, a place to be <laughs> or lights to turn on, you know, and I think to Leah's point, um, it's that work behind the scenes. You know, our organization, we are extraordinarily fortunate. We've been in the community since 1975. We're approaching our 50 year anniversary. And I think a lot of that is because A, we've had tremendous support from the community, but also we are, we're tough on ourselves and our resources. You know, we're, we're mindful of the store. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we care very much that the funding that we're getting is coming out of people's pockets, just like yours. And so it's money that we want to be very careful with. Um, the other thing is just through COVID, you know, it's been very interesting in, in the past. I've, you know, always done grant writing and things for my own organization. And that's certainly part of my responsibility, but we've expanded that work through COVID and um, I've actually rent, written some grants for several other organizations. And to Leah's point about, you know, community over competition, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how we get it done. Uh, sometimes it is a collection of resources and skills and expertise. And um, I think that's why these collaborations are important. And then the last thing is sort of on the, the opportunity side, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, one great thing about working in a small community like this one is the opportunity for collaboration. I mean, in my three short years, I have probably worked with 50 local agencies. It, it's just extraordinary. And um, the more we do it, the more opportunities come. And it, it's really exciting because it marshals resources and, and puts, you know, skills together that, that sometimes aren't all in one place. So it's, it's exciting um, and I'm proud to work with these two girls, but many others of you on the call as well, so. While we were having this conversation, the chat um, box was like lighting up. And so I was gonna pull in something thing about that because we were talking about um, the challenges with um, our nonprofit leadership. And we touched on the fact that of our boards kind of cross over sometimes and things. And the conversation came up about the real challenge of having diversity on your board and um, which can be difficult in a community that isn't extremely diverse um, and having that representation. I know that our board of 21 um, is, a, is probably pretty larger than most nonprofits, but we're equal if not one or two more on the male female division. And um, we have specific efforts in identifying what we lack within our community or our board in representation um, to the point that we even present that for, we are nationally accredited um, with the council foundations that we present that to them to show them our representation. Um, not just for checking a box, but because we're serving a community, we need 
people serving on our board that know our community's needs and that are intimately involved on all levels. So I think a diverse board is extremely important. And yes, it is difficult because of the makeup of our community, but perhaps it's also because we are not reaching out and asking others to be a part. I don't know, what do you girls think? Julie, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, we also uh, employ a, a diversity tool when we're putting our board together. It has been, uh, I'm just being frank, an extraordinarily difficult process to diversify our board and make sure that we have representation. I cannot say that we are perfect at it because I don't think we are. Um, I do think over the past couple of years, we have tried to engage in parts of our community that are underrepresented with the hope of making some connections and enticing some folks to get more involved with us, but there's always more work that can be done. Um, and it's, it's an ongoing effort and it is a deeply challenging problem in a community that, that is not incredibly diverse. Um, so there's definitely more work to do, but I feel like we're at least thinking about it and it's present in our mind when we're thinking about our leaders and our board members and our volunteers for the future. Um, and I think it will continue to better our organization as we're able to encourage more folks of diversity to join. I will echo you know, very much um, what the two of you have said. So just this, the numbers in my committee, so we have five women who serve as um, board of directors out of 12. So we're, you know, we're nearly half to the halfway mark. Um, you know, again, one of the interesting things about my organization is that in order to be a member, a corporate council member, which you must be in order to serve as a board of director, unless you're a, a chair of a committee, um, you need to be the leader in your business. And so, you know, that goes back to looking at diversity across, um, you know, sort of across the, the region in terms of you know, are there women who lead businesses? And, you know, what we identified at the end of last year as part of a year of the woman um, effort in our organization is that there are many, many, many women leading not only businesses, but organizations in the region. It's actually, I was quite impressed and I've had a lot of feedback from many of you and, and many others um, at how many women there really are le as leaders in the community, but it's definitely an issue. And once you get past just sort of that piece of the equity and diversity, it's much more difficult. So we have actually engaged a consultant. Um, I was part of, with Julie actually, as part of my cohort, um, an ARC program this winter that offered uh, nonprofit leaders sort of um, additional training in, um, in the cohort that Julie and I served in. We were in a fundraising cohort, but the consultant, uh, John Bowser from the Hargo Hargrove International out of Georgia uh, has, we've retained him um, to, to consult with my firm, or sorry, my board in a governance initiative. So we're a couple of months into that initiative and you know we're looking at justice, equity, diversity, um, and inclusion issues. And that will certainly be part of the work that we're doing. We're actually in the process right now, uh, this week and next, benchmarking our organization to four other high-performing, uh, similarly situated organizations from across the region. So I'll be really interested to see, you know, as compared to what, what's happening with our organization, what other org high, very high-performing organizations are doing in this regard. Um, but you know, it's, it's definitely a major issue for sure. I'm going to pop in for just a moment. This is amazing to listen to what you're sharing. Um, we are about an hour into the session and we're going to give you a little bit more time to discuss things. I'm kind of feeling like the zoom fatigue topic might come up soon. And actually as a way to help us address that together, um, we're going to take one moment and just look away from the screen. If you want to turn off your video and get up and stretch for a moment, we're just going to do that. <laughs> so just take a pause, everybody. This is about mindful well-being.
Got to start with small steps sometimes, but I know that um, this has been a topic of discussion about how we are in these virtual sessions all the time. And the time's actually going pretty fast. So I want to make sure we have some time before 730 to have some interaction with our participants. But I want to turn back to you all um, to see if you do have any thoughts on this topic of how to engage in these kind of contexts and how maybe in some ways there have been some benefits or some drawbacks to doing the leadership work that you're doing and being in a virtual context now. I think, um, as you said, there are pros and cons to it. Um, our board and all of our committee meetings have been held via Zoom from just about a week or two after the shutdown, um, we started into it. And, you know, we walked through our board uh, through the ins and outs and how to's because we had a lot of board members that weren't comfortable or weren't familiar with um, handling a Zoom. Um, and so that's pretty important for educating all those involved, um, whether it's with other agencies that you work with or your board or, or um, colleagues. But I have found um, better attendance because we don't have the travel challenge in serving our three counties. You know, we have board members traveling from Garrett County down to Allegheny County for a meeting or two meetings a month. Um, we have some who go away, um, we call snowbirds that are in Florida while we're meeting and now they can meet with us. So it's really been, um, a great way to remain connected and have in, improved attendance for us. Now on the flip side, I think we've all seen the fact that um, because of that convenience, we tend to have more uh, meetings scheduled and we have the lack of time in between the meetings to prepare for downtime um, or to debrief and wrap up what you were supposed to do from that. And, and that required for me some real boundaries um, and revisiting, you know, what is most important for us to accomplish? Is it that we're trying to accomplish too much in these times where we aren't able to be in person and accomplish things? Or is it also too much for myself in trying to handle uh, more meetings in one day? And that just took some personal um, evaluation. Julie, what did you do? Um, <clears throat> well, a, a slightly different bit. I mean, obviously, look, we all get tired of Zoom. And I think Leah makes a really good point about, you know, whatever strategy you use, whether that's time blocking or um, if you're like me, you adopt a strategy this week and then next week you might have a whole new strategy, uh, you know, and it's hard to make something stick. I know for me personally, um, there are days that I feel like I don't breathe between calls and I will have pages and pages of work that is that comes out of the meetings, but then little time to do the work. Um, so that's been a little challenging. And I think that just, you know, to Leah's point really requires that we manage our time in a slightly different way. Um, I know I personally have also gotten very focused on meetings. We are starting on time. We are ending on time. We are not going to drift and do you know, two hours or an hour and 45 minutes, everyone has a schedule. Um, but, uh, you know, again, on the flip side, as Leah, because so much of our work is visually oriented, we've had no choice but to pivot. And in some ways, I feel like that has just opened the floodgates of opportunity for us to do things that we've never done before. We've never even tried. And frankly, you know, we just sort of went in like with our eyes closed and just hope for the best sometimes. And it's actually been fun. You know, it's, it's given us an opportunity to try some new things and think a little differently. And I think that we will employ um, some of the things that we've adopted moving forward and really diversify our offerings. So I guess it took COVID to get us there, but it's, it's been kind of a nice, a nice win out of that. I have to add, I have to toot my horn and Julie's horn, if I'm permitted to. Um, the whole COVID experience and having to go um, virtual really forced us, as she said, to figure out how to do the things that we had done prior, or were we just going to sit by and let things, you know, stagnate? 
And so um, Julie was the first organization that I knew of that did a live um, event, which she did a fireside chat um, of artwork and it was phenomenal, had her own challenges, bounced back and did it. Um, we had our um, signature event where we honor a humanitarian every year and it was our 10th anniversary. And um, the board made the decision to go forward and we'd figure out a way and we did. And we had, um, did it virtually. And um, it was rewarding to have other organizations come to us and say, can we talk about how you did that? Can you help us in, in moving forward and trying that ourselves? It was very scary, extremely scary. We could have been a complete failure. We both had challenges, we, we dealt with them, but it, was a way of, as you said, pivoting. And also it's refreshing because now going forward, we can take this new model, tweak it, and maybe refresh what we've been doing traditionally before and involve more people that never would have been um, involved in the events. Sorry, and Jennifer, it's your turn. I see. No, don't be sorry. I totally agree with you. And I'm just really, it's, you know, I'm glad you're tooting your own horn, horn because both of you did those events so beautifully. I think you both really demonstrated how you can hold a really engaging, thoughtful, interesting um, experience virtually. And that has been the challenge for all of us. You know, I'm sure everyone on this call is experiencing that. I think it's really incumbent upon us to, you know, be playful, to show up in a way that's, you know, not just robotic and, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting space, but I also think, you know, if you're present, I, for me, the biggest challenge, and I mean, no disrespect for anyone who has their camera off, but when you're trying to lead a meeting and there's just cameras, you know, I really am trying to find ways to get folks to turn their camera on. I know that the broadband issues can be a challenge, so I, de I definitely respect that. And there are days that, look, I have to show up and lead meetings that I don't want to turn my camera on. So I certainly have grace and, you know, respect um, for, for how, you know, how we're all showing up in a different way. But I do think it's, you know, I think as playful as we can be in this space, um, the more interesting we can make it, the better. And I also think that just as you're talking about, Leah, you know, finding new ways to be more purposeful about the way that we gather in person is sort of, you know, we ended up having an event in October in just like, it just was very fortuitous the way that it came together. And, you know, in thinking um, we ended up having our event at 1812, which I'm so glad that we got a chance to do that because we really were able to have this lovely um, event in a space with Dr. McCat. And, and I'm just so pleased with our organization that we were able to, you know, that that, was, that that was able to come together in that wild time. But it really, you know, it was such an incredible event to be together in person. And so I think what I'm going to be mindful of in my organization is, you know, when should we gather in person and when can we just take care of business virtually? And how can we be more mindful of people's time, but also recognize that, you know, networking and cultivating relationships isn't necessarily as easy to do in this medium than when we're in person. Mm -hmm. So I think as we look forward and I'm guessing, you know, all of us feel that way that there's a hybrid model that will work better for all of our organizations. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. And I'm, I know that um, again, on that note of wanting to respect the balance of work and life, um, we are just going to ask you to reflect on one more topic or one more question that the three of you wanted to share. Um, I'll ask the question because it's, I think it's the most fun question of all, um, at least for me personally. And um, I wanted to ask the other two ladies, what does your connection with the rest of our group today mean to you? And how did this circle of support come about in your life? So Leah, you want to start? You know, in our brainstorming session about this, we never did go back to the real start date. And I um, either am showing my needs or my incomplete ability to think that I can't identify that, but um, this, this um, connection with the other two ladies in particular is so valuable in my life um, 
as we identified that we didn't necessarily feel like we fit the bill for a nonprofit leader. We weren't um, schooled in nonprofit. We hadn't really had a lot of experience, if any, in nonprofit work. Um, so when the three of us found each other, it was like finding um, a home because we could then kind of let our guard down and go, oh my, I don't know what I'm doing. And the other one could say the same thing. And then- I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm the only one that's- um, For every day. <laughs> it was, it turned into um, a, a mastermind group, like where we could come together and we could brainstorm what our issues or our challenges were and how we could help each other meet them. And if we had already a um, face that what we had done and so this is my these ladies are my support group um, in doing my job and as we all know you know we have friends you know when you graduate high school you have this huge group of friends you spend all this time with and then you go to college you have this new group and then you start a job and that group starts to dwindle because you are so focused on your job um, getting your family taken care of in those things. And you don't really build that network that isn't, um, that is professional and personal related together. And so these ladies have met, met that for me and has um, really boosted my confidence and my accomplishment. Thank you. Jen? Uh, ditto the same, you know, I think it's just really, you, you know, it can be, you know, to be in leadership is a thing and it can be a little bit lonely. Um, and, you know, to work in a nonprofit is a very particular type of thing, especially when you have, you know, many folks who are your bosses and um, it's, you know, I think it's just a very unique experience. And so it's been lovely to have both of you understand the work piece, but also to have this really beautiful chemistry that just, you know, it's fun to hang out and, and get to know both of you and talk about our personal lives and chat about things that we're interested in. And I'm just, I feel really lucky to have, you know, two, two gals who can share a lot of those experiences with me. Yeah. And I'll, I mean, I echo the same. Um, it is, it can be a little lonely sometimes when you work in a service role because you're always expected to be serving. And sometimes, uh, sometimes people forget that you're still human <laughs> under all that. Um, so it is nice to have a, a network. Um, aside from that though, I will say that part of the reason, at least in this particular particular friendship or conglomeration of people. Another person on this call tonight, Marion Leonard, who is just, just a wonderful champion and advocate, uh, said something to me one time about being a convener of people. And it has something that has really stuck in my mind. It rattles around all the time. And I would just say to all of you, whether you're students or whether you're in your professional life or just a community member, um, giving someone else the gift of friendship through work or through personal or common interests is really extraordinary. And it is an art form. And so when you find someone who connects you with like-minded people, um, it really can create this incredible explosion in your life. And so I would just say that we all have the opportunity to do that, to be conveners of people. So think about the people that you know and how how they might connect together to support one another. So, um, but yes, I'm, I'm very fortunate. And, and some of you tonight on this call are friends and supporters and advocates and I'm deeply thankful for all of you. Ditto. Thank you so much, ladies. I really appreciate that you took the time to prepare, you know, and your connection, of course, comes through. And I think, you know, what's nice is, again, it's not just the three of you. There's an, you know, expanded network involved here of, of colleagues and community members that care about Western Maryland. Um, that includes our students. And to me, that's how we achieve, you know, really being inclusive is that we do have these conversations and these ways of convening, you know, across campus and community. Um, we did invite some of our FSU alumni who are also involved in nonprofit work now. 
um, students and, and, you know, local members that might or might not be affiliated with FSU directly. And so we want to give them a little bit of space of time to participate in the conversation, either by asking a question or adding an insight or just, you know, reflecting on your own interests in nonprofit leadership. So what I'm going to ask you to do is go ahead and put something in the chat if you'd like, and we can call on you if you want to participate um, in voice. I do encourage you, as we talked about a little earlier, to turn on your video now so you can be present present with each other here as we finish out and they're going to be together another 10 minutes or so. And, um, you know, just join in it, You can also raise your hand if you'd like to participate either, you know, we'll scan the screen. If we see your hand sticking up really in person there at home, or if you want to use the zoom, um, uh, you know, way of raising your hand. So anyone want to start and, and follow up with any comments or questions? We shall start with a comment. Okay. We've been treated to uh, almost an hour and 20 minutes of extraordinary leadership from three extraordinary women that we all should be very grateful are part of our community and lead us forward because I, I have the pleasure of working with two of them on a very regular basis. And I can't imagine the kinds of things that we wouldn't do in this community if it were not for the leadership of, of these women. So my, my hat's off. Uh, to each of you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Can I chime in? Certainly. Go ahead, Marianne. Uh, Alicia, I just want to say thank you for doing this. Um, I know a lot of this is mindfulness based, and I've been an I've been a big advocate of mindfulness based kind of leadership. And Jennifer, Julie, and Leah, I can't say enough about these dynamic women. And I think they're here at the right time because this community is a caring community. It's a connected community and it's a collaborative community. And I think we really do want to solve the problems that we have, we've been the flyover zone. And I think we really have so much talent and so much potential that together collectively in a mindful way can solve them. So I'm just deeply uh, grateful, grateful uh, for you setting up this seminar with three dynamic uh, women leaders. Thank you for being here. So Alicia, if I may just uh, chime in for a moment. Uh, sure. Again, uh, echoing uh, the sentiments expressed by Al and by uh, Marion, who's a, who's a dear friend and, and a, a longtime colleague. And great to see you, Marion, <laughs> um, here in this setting. But I, I just wanted to echo, I think, uh, how inspiring I think it was to hear um, these uh, authentic representations of, of leadership that we are seeing, I think, in our, in our community. And, and kudos to, to the three leaders uh, for sharing. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm scanning just to see if I see any hands or. Alicia, are there, stu th first of all, thank you all. That's just so incredibly kind. Are there students um, who are participating who are interested in nonprofit leadership? Is there anyone willing to share? I think that's a great question. And I wondered that myself. I wonder if any of you would have specific questions or maybe talk about what you might be interested in doing yourselves in the future. Hello, Dr. Arminsky. Hello, Braden. So um, awesome job, everyone. I think it was a great presentation and a overall great conversation. Um, to go off what you just said, I have a very busy future ahead of me, I feel like, with working in small business and starting my own stuff. But there, small um, nonprofit, an, a nonprofit organization is something I would love to get involved in. I just feel like I have to figure out something that is connected to me and my lifestyle to make it worth my while. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to state that for you guys. Brayden, do you want to tell them what you're going to be exploring entrepreneurially, what that small business idea is? 
Yeah, so um, my buddy and I back him in Cecil County, Maryland, uh, where he's starting a restaurant and I'm going to run it for him. And I have a bunch of years of experience working in the seafood industry. Um, I'm also going to get into taxidermy and a bunch of other stuff along the road. Um, just the restaurants, just the beginning, but eventually uh, seafood distribution throughout like the state of Maryland and stuff um privately not like uh nationally but for like state of maryland and stuff so what do you think it is about nonprofit work that you think would connect to the interests that you have or i don't know if it would connect to some of those things you're working on right well we're going to be a community establishment and uh the owner and i are high in the community as, as well as our families so I think we both want to do something for the community as far as a nonprofit or get something started. Um, obviously, we have a lot of work to do with the restaurant stuff coming, but um, it's just something that I think is really cool to offer to the community, such for someone like ours. Um, it used to be a really tight community, but I feel like over the years and you know, it growing has really changed that. And I think our business being in the center of our county um, and on the rise and being the popular thing, perhaps we can influence, you know, a change of where we live and stuff. I think that'd be cool. Alicia, Thanks for sharing. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say something to Braden. Um, we were kind of chatting about this the other day during our planning discussion, but it doesn't really matter what community you live in, there's work to be done. And we've, we've spoke, focused a lot tonight on leaders and boards of directors, but the reality is there's, you know, hundreds and thousands and millions of volunteers and not everyone has to uh, take on a leadership role. In fact, some people are quite comfortable being behind the scenes and never having their face seen and that's perfectly acceptable also. Um, and all of those folks are really needed as well. So Braden, whatever you decide to do, find something that is near and dear to your heart and your community and put your support behind it, whether with time or financially, but every little bit makes a difference. So I just want someone like him to know that he has big plans for his life, but that doesn't mean that he can't still do something for his community along the way. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Uh, Julie, Thank I you very appreciate much that. For that. So yeah. I would just offer that you are already in a community. So, you know, there are <laughs> 800 <laughs> nonprofits right here in Allegheny County that would, I'm sure, love your volunteer time. And, you know, it's an excellent way to connect with leaders and business people and other, you know, folks in your community who are really engaged and want to see, you know, life improved. And so, if you have any level of interest, I'm sure that, you know, you could certainly connect with any one of us um, and we could help steer you in a direction if, if the missions that we're serving are not necessarily your interest. But I think there are lots of opportunities for students to be engaged in the nonprofit work in our community as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's fabulous that at your age, you're even in tune to or um, compassionate about something that your community may need. And like Julie said, volunteer or serving in a nonprofit looks different for everyone. It might be your time that you can give. It might be your talent that something you can do that the nonprofit could use, or it's your treasure, which is your finances. So, um, and it might change over your life, um, depending on what you have more of at the time. And I know we struggle with getting younger people involved in nonprofits because of the, the, the demands at their job or their families or growing families and things like that. But truly, the sooner you get involved with nonprofits, the more it becomes a lifestyle. Um, and you fit that or feel the reward that comes with um, serving others. So I just wanna encourage you. I think you've just encouraged me hearing that a young person is that passionate about wanting to give back and it's planned alongside your future business goals. Yeah, I think that's Thank great. You. Thanks, Braden, so much for jumping in and helping us to think about that together, because that is part of, you know, the 
a goal here is to offer our students as well as our community members opportunities to learn about leadership, to engage in it or, you know, connect or network around it. Leadership is not always positional, you know, as you've heard throughout this discussion, it is part of a collective effort, a collaboration, a cooperation. And so sometimes it is just being a citizen of that community or an organization, you know, not even in a paid position. So I think that's a really good point. You know, we don't just belong to one organization. It also makes me think of Ken, who's here with us today, who is um, someone who was a student here at Frostburg State some time ago, right, Ken Oldham? And uh, you basically uh, came back in a sense, right, to contribute in uh, some kind of a capacity that's kind of giving back to this region, right? Yeah, that's right. A absolutely. <laughs> thank, thank you, Alicia. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that just as a final note about, you know, how you think um, maybe nonprofit leadership is connected to our region in terms of, you know, how we can work together, whether you're here geographically or not? Yeah, well, I've always looked at nonprofit service as both a profession and, and a volunteer service. So um, I participate. I'm, I'm the CEO of United Way of Frederick County. Uh, we do a lot of work um, in, in, our, in our region and, and statewide as, as well. But I also can't come back and um, have, have focused a lot on, on Frostburg State University as, as the primary um, volunteer service that I participate in. And not only has it been um, really fun, um, but it's also been great for business. And I've learned a ton um, being on that side. So I serve on the board of director, directors of the uh, Frostburg State University Foundation Board. Um, and a, as an employee who works for a board of directors, I get the, in this role, I get an opportunity to be on the board of directors, which is, which is a heck of a lot of fun. And I've learned a ton about what it is to volunteer and what it is to, to give back and the uh, fiduciary and governance responsibilities on that side of the table rather than as, a, um, as, as an executive director or an employee of a nonprofit organization. Um, and the, the, the Frostburg State University um, Foundation does an incredible amount, amount of work. I know there, there was at least uh, uh, one member of the board of directors here, Marion Leonard, great to see you um, from afar. I look forward to seeing you again in person one day. Uh, and um, you know, that, that group does a ton of work of raising money and allocating dollars for scholarships and other projects uh, to ensure that uh, Frostburg State University is, is the best it can possibly be. And there's no, no time that's more important for that than right now. Um, so we're, we're, we're working real hard to try to pr provide new opportunities to, um, to faculty and students um, moving forward. It's a very critical time. Thanks, Ken. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I thought, you know, that makes sense that we wrap up with those thoughts because, you know, there is a place for everyone and, you know, it might not be right now either. I would say, don't get overwhelmed if you think about how you have to add all these parts to your life, but we probably could hear is that people do have many aspects of their lives that intersect or, you know, that kind of branch out even in some areas. And the more that you network and show up, you know, and interact with people and learn who they are and what they do, what makes them feel good about what they do. And the more that those opportunities will come and kind of fall into place, sometimes they are employment opportunities, right? Sometimes they're just connections in your community that you can give back to. So we are going to wrap it up so that we can make sure we stay on time. And I just want to thank all of you again. Thank you so much, Leah, Jennifer, and Julie. Thank you to our co-sponsors and for everyone who was here tonight. So have a good evening. And uh, remember, Day of Civility is next week. Watch for some more events through the Communication Leadership Lab and our partners. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Talk to you soon. Good night. Thanks, everyone.